When you think of iconic seasons in baseball history, what comes to mind? I need three banana because the monkey never claps. 1998, 1961, maybe the fever dream that was the COVID shortened season of 2020. The virtual fans, they still haunt my dreams. But what if I told you that one season in particular broke baseball? And not with a fancy home run race or horrifying fans, but with an MLB record number of perfect games, MLB's next Japanese star actually living up to the hype. One of the best teams in baseball shutting down their ace. But wait, there's more. The debuts of not one, but two generational talents and an MVP race that literally changed how we think of the MVP award. Everybody strap in. It's time to head back to the summer of 2012. Not because it actually was stupid. We'll get to that. But because it might just have broken baseball. Or at least, how we think of baseball. Welcome to Good Vibes Baseball. Please consider subscribing if you haven't. I do appreciate you either way. Now let's get into some good vibes, shall we? Of the 238,277 games played in Major League history, just 24 of them have been perfect. In fact, the odds of us seeing one were once estimated at one in every 34 seasons. Four teams haven't even existed that long. But the summer of 2012? Well, it said to hell with the odds and gave us something we'd never seen before and might never see again. Three perfect games in one season. And they range from, oh yeah, of course he threw one, to, what the shit, he threw one? Starting with maybe the most unlikely of perfect games. Seriously, there's an article on it and everything. It's April 21st, and the Chicago White Sox were in Seattle to face the Mariners. Philip Humber, a former third overall pick of the Mets, but a 29-year-old making just his 30th major league start that April day, he was simply trying to stay in the rotation by providing a solid start. Well, 27 outs and one controversial check swing third strike call later, and Humber would throw just the 21st perfect game in Major League history. And luckily for this video, numbers 22 and 23 would soon follow. Matt Cain might be in my top five favorite pitchers ever. He and Tim Lincecum were my favorite Giants to watch growing up. He was the ultimate hard luck loser. He was with the Giants for three World Series titles, but is a career sub 500 winner. So looking at his career numbers, we aren't necessarily sending Mr. Kane to Cooperstown. Sure, his postseason numbers were fantastic, but the regular season, again, not necessarily Cooperstown worthy. Good thing he's already got a spot in the hall though, thanks to what he did on June 13th of this crazy 2012 season. In the midst of a very solid season already, Kane would defy those 1 in 34 season odds even more and pitch the 22nd perfect game in Major League history. And it was the first ever perfect game in Giants history. Aided by two excellent defensive plays by Milky Cabrera, who'd actually end up getting suspended for testing positive for high testosterone levels later that year while he was in the midst of a career year, and Gregor Blanco respectively. Kane would actually tie Sandy Koufax for the most strikeouts in a perfecto with 14, which would also end up being his career high. It might be one of the greatest games ever pitched, and Kane's immediate quote upon leaving the dog pile, this is stupid. And what's funnier is Kane almost threw a perfect game earlier that season if it wasn't for Pirates pitcher James McDonald. But Kane's actual perfect game would mark the second of the season, joining 1880 and 2010 as the only seasons with two perfect games thrown. Pretty impressive. But if we really want to break a trend, two won't do. Luckily, King Felix kept this party going. It's August 15th, 2012, and the Seattle Mariners are not great. 14 and a half games back, to be precise. But Felix Hernandez, he was a freaking stud. Having won the Cy Young just two years prior, this was prime King Felix. 
He posted a B-War of at least 3.6 for nine straight years, including his career best 7.2 in that Cy Young winning campaign. And you know what? 2012 is no outlier by any means. His fielding independent pitching that year of 2.84 led the American League. But even though he was one of the best pitchers in baseball, just like the Giants, no one in Mariners history had thrown a perfect game. Until that day. The game itself was pretty uneventful, aside from it being a perfect game. King Felix dominated in a 1-0 Mariners win, and just like that, 2012 became the first and only season with three perfect games. This third perfect game also broke the odds, as it was the second perfect game at the then Safeco Field that year, as the Mariners were on the losing end of Humbers back in April, also a first. But it wasn't just the perfectives. There were also four other no-hitters in 2012. But speaking of excellent pitching that broke past our expectations, 2012 brought us the arrival of one of the most hyped pitchers of the 2000s, the Japanese ace, Yu Darvish. Seeing the recent success of Japanese pitchers coming over from the MPB makes my heart happy. The $700 million man himself, Shohei Otani for example, or Kodai Senga of the Mets, their success is almost taken for granted at this point. Fingers crossed for Yoshinobu Yamamoto. But back in 2012, the most recent super hype Japanese ace to sign a big deal was Daisuke Matsuzaka and his mythical gyro ball. Check out Sportstorm's excellent video on Daisuke, but long story short, the hype, it was absolutely crazy. The Red Sox ended up paying a $51.1 million posting fee and another $52 million on his actual contract for him to not only not throw a gyro ball, but he'd end up only having two solid seasons before injuries became too much to overcome, and that was that. Sure, he helped the Red Sox win a World Series in 07, and 2008, he was a beauty, but he didn't live up to the level of hype that preceded his arrival. Fast forward to 2012, and there's a little deja vu happening. Yu Darvish is coming off of an incredible seven-year run in the MPB, where he compiled a record of 93-38 and 38 with an ERA of 199, a sub-1000 whip, and 8.9 caves per nine. The hype for this man's arrival was something else. I know I created you and MLB The Show at least a year before he was posted. The man with 11 pitches, Darvish was absolutely expected to succeed. But with Daisuke coming off of just seven starts in 2011, you can understand some apprehension. Well, the Rangers threw caution to the win and won the bidding rights to sign Darvish. Breaking the record Daisuke set when he came over, the Rangers paid $51.7 million for the posting fee and then signed Darvish to a six-year, $60 million deal. Considering Daisuke's injury issues and previous failed attempts by fellow countrymen Hideki Arabu and Kiyagawa, How could you give $12 million to Hideki Arabu? This was absolutely a risk. While Darvish not only broke this trend, he'd end up shattering it. His 2012 season in particular was absolutely a great start. He put up a pitching line of 16-9 with a 3.90 ERA and 221 strikeouts. That ERA doesn't tell the full story either, as his fielding independent pitching was 3.29. Great success. His immediate success eased many concerns on Darvish's contract. But if we're going to talk about pitching phenoms, concerns, and all of that, well, we have to talk about one storyline of 2012 that broke a lot of people's brains. Steven Strasburg and the Washington Nationals. Things haven't been the brightest in D.C. the past several seasons. Bryce Harper leaves, then Juan Soto. Sure, they might have my favorite prospect pool moving into 2024, but back in 2012, well, they hadn't made the playoffs since becoming the Nationals. Things weren't great. Until, all of a sudden, they were! That Nats team in 2012 was a revelation. Led by a very strong starting rotation, solid veteran leadership, and of course, the rookie phenom Bryce Harper, the Nats won 98 games that year, which was good for the most in baseball. 
They claimed the NL East crown too before losing to the Cardinals in the NLDS. But remember that rotation? Well, that's where the Nats broke our way of thinking. Steven Strasburg was one of baseball's biggest phenoms, maybe ever. But in 2012, he was still coming back from 2010 Tommy John surgery, so folks didn't necessarily know what to expect from him. Well, he came out the gates firing. He was maybe one of the best pitchers in baseball to start that season. And wouldn't you know it, as Strasburg went, so did the Nats. Gio Gonzalez, Jordan Zimmerman, and Strasburg formed their very own big three that season, as the Nats took the baseball world by total surprise. It was a wild ride. Until it wasn't. Remember how Strasburg was coming off of Tommy John? Well, the Nats, along with his doctor, had decided to set an innings limit for him that season to mitigate risk of another injury. So here are the Nats, maybe the best team in baseball, in September, and they shut down one of, if not their best pitchers. I get it. I do. But the Nats could have gone deeper with the playoffs with him? Hmm, maybe. But this genuinely broke away from the norm. Typically, it's win now. Kind of refreshing. But if we're going to talk about phenoms in the 2012 season, we have to talk about the respective Rookie of the Years that season. We've had some amazing rookie seasons in MLB history. Ichiro, Mark McGuire. We've even had amazing rookies in both leagues in the same year. Judge and Bellinger in 2017, for example. But if there's a pair of Rookie of the Year winners that absolutely broke baseball in the same season, it's Harper and Trout of 2012. These two legends will forever be linked to each other. Fair or not, it's absolutely valid. For starters, they both debuted in their true rookie years on the exact same day, April 28th. And boy, did they not disappoint. Both players made immediate marks on the game. Case in point, the May 6th game where Harper is intentionally plunked by Philly's great Cole Hamels, ends up making his way to third base, and then becomes the first teenager since 1964 to steal home. It was electric. Think 2023 Ellie De La Cruz type stuff. Now the NL Rookie of the Year race isn't what broke baseball though. We'll save that for the 2012 MVP race. But Bryce didn't necessarily run away with the award either. His numbers were very solid, his 5.3 B-War would also earn him a 30th place MVP finish, but it was the way Harper played the game, the passion, the cockiness, it was awesome, but also pissed a lot of people off. Mike Trout on the other hand, well he went about it differently. But even without the brashness, his rookie season of 2012, it was maybe the best rookie season ever. He led the league in stolen bases, runs, and B-War. He hit 326, slugged 564, tacked on 30 nukes, all while playing a mean center field. And you want to talk about breakout moments? How about his absolute robbery of Orioles' J.J. Hardy on June 27th? Trout may not have wanted the attention, but he got a ton of it. But unlike Harper and his 30th place MVP finish, Trout decided to take it one step further. He wasn't happy with the Rookie of the Award. His 2012 season? Well, it would end up altering how we thought of the MVP award forever. Nowadays, the stat war is a very accepted, if not one of the more prominent stats in baseball. It's a great tool to demonstrate how valuable a player was compared to his peers in a given season. We trust it. But back in 2012, not so much. So when Miguel Cabrera decided to go all beast mode and hit for the Triple Crown in 2012, well, it caused a bit of a conundrum, because it was a foregone conclusion that the MVP was his, right? Well, Mike Trout, he was fantastic, and Adrian Beltre was his future Hall of Fame self. But again, it's the Triple Crown. 330, 44 bombs, and 139 runs batted in is absolutely nutty. No one had accomplished that feat since Yaz for the Red Sox in 1967. And from a B-War perspective, 7.1. Cabrera's season was excellent. But that's where our issue arises. Trout's that year, 10.5. 2.4 more wins above replacement. 
that's essentially the difference between a replacement level player and a full-on starting level player. He blew the competition out of the water that year too from a B-War perspective. If you combine Miguel Cabrera and Derek Jeter, who finished seventh in the MVP voting that year, you'd still be more than a full win less valuable than Mike Trout that year. Baseball Reference even quotes this season as one of the defining seasons for war in general. How could a literal 20-year-old come into the league and beat out the first Triple Crown winner since 1967? Well, he didn't. But in 2012, Mike Trout literally broke how we thought of baseball. All right, I think we've established that the 2012 season broke baseball in numerous ways. As Matt Cain said, it was stupid, but stupid in an amazing way. We might never see something like it again, whether it's the most perfect games in a single season ever, a Japanese phenom living up to the hype, or maybe the most electric set of Rookie of the Year award winners ever. I think we can agree it was special. But if those weren't enough for you, there's actually a lot more too. How about Chipper's farewell tour? This was his final year. Or Ichiro Suzuki getting traded to the Yanks all hush-hush like. Or how about you look up Jamie Moyer? He had a very neat 2012 season. It seems like everywhere you look, 2012 gave us something that broke from the norm. But you tell me, baseball fans, did the 2012 season break baseball? What was your favorite moment from this wacky season? Let me know down below. Thanks so much, everyone. Please subscribe if you haven't, and be sure to check out my other videos. I do appreciate you guys either way, but until next time, baseball fans, cheers!